of his own capabilities and of his administration's capabilities and of America's capabilities. And that's the primary reason I believe that he keeps entangling us in all these disastrous foreign adventures, right? He's gotten us into a disaster in Ukraine, which has cost the lives of tens of thousands of Ukrainians, just a completely unnecessary war. He has put America right in the middle of the Israel versus Arab conflict. And he's been overly provocative with regard to Taiwan. And so we are at the edge of all these disastrous conflicts. And I think I get the, the primary reason, all right? And th- because I share some of these same, cap- same problems, these same tendencies, and that's this you know, vastly exaggerated sense of one's own abilities, all right? Now, I, I do have abilities, right? There are some areas where I'm top 1%, all right? I'm probably better read than 99% of people. I'm probably, there are some areas where I'm uh, you know, better writer than 99% of people, but I, I've consistently gone through life with a vastly exaggerated sense of my own abilities. And Joe Biden, for, for whatever reason, he thinks he's some you know, major foreign policy thinker. And in some ways, he's right in that with regard to Afghanistan, Joe Biden pulled us out of Afghanistan, and I believe that was the, the right policy to follow. Joe Biden counseled Barack Obama against surging in Afghanistan back in 2009. Again, I think that was correct. So Joe Biden has been right at times, but now with his disastrous involvement of us in Ukraine and uh, in, in Israel in the fight with Hamas and now Hezbollah, the, the, probably the most important news article that uh, I, I've read in the last uh, 48 hours is from the Financial Times talking about how Israel warns it can no longer accept Hezbollah on its border. Right? Hezbollah is this Iranian-backed Shia militia that is 10 times as capable, 10 times as disciplined, 10 times as formidable a force as Hamas. And now Financial Times reports Israel's National Security Advisor warned that Israel can no longer accept the presence of Hezbollah forces on its northern border and said it will have to act if they continue to pose a threat. Now, Hezbollah's got about 150,000 rockets, thousands of which can reach anywhere in Israel. So if Hezbollah decides to let its rockets go, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of Israelis will die within, within hours. So tensions between Israel and the powerful Iran-backed Lebanese militant group have been running high since the war between Israel and Hamas erupted two months ago. Now, Hezbollah is an Iranian proxy, but it has its own agency. It does not solely take direction from Iran. It's an interesting question, given that the United States has moved such considerable military force to the Middle East, why we have not already attacked Iran, but it does appear that uh, the Biden administration is very eager to, for a direct war with Iran. So far, despite the free, frequent exchanges, which have led to casualties on both sides, Israel and Hezbollah have so far avoided being drawn into a full-blown conflict. But uh, Israel's foreign minister said yesterday that Israel could not accept the situation in which residents of Israel's north, who were evacuated in the early weeks of the war, were afraid to return to their homes as they feared Hezbollah's elite Radwan force could launch a cross-border attack on the north of Israel, as Hamas did in the south. That, that's correct. So Israel has had to evacuate about 200,000 of its citizens from the south and the north of the country because it does not feel that it can adequately protect them. And no nation state would uh, sit back and allow a a powerful threat on its borders, uh, particularly a powerful threat that has repeatedly attacked it, like Hezbollah. So here's the exact wording from Israel's foreign minister. We can no longer accept the Radwan force sitting on the border. The Israeli public understand the situation in the north needs to change, and it will change. Hezbollah agrees to change it diplomatically. That's good. If not, we will have to act. We will have to ensure that the situation in the north is different. Wow. So Israel right now is cleaning up. Hamas seems to be making considerable advances. Uh, Dozens of Hamas fighters have recently surrendered. Eventually, though, Israel is going to turn its primary attention not to the south and to Gaza, but to the north and Hezbollah, and uh, it may well be forced into a two-front war. Uh, Let's get a little theory here from the Duran. Let's talk about a tweet from Tucker Carlson connected to Project Ukraine and Lloyd Austin and the funding to Project Ukraine. Let me read you what uh, Tucker Carlson posted on Twitter X. 
the Biden administration is openly threatening Americans over Ukraine. In a classified briefing in the House yesterday, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin informed members that if they don't appropriate more money for Zelensky, quote, we'll send your uncles, cousins, and sons to fight Russia, end quote. Then Tucker says, pay the oligarchs or we'll kill your kids. And uh, this tweet has, uh, has received quite a lot of uh, attention. Elon Musk replied, he really said this, question mark. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy also uh, chimed in on this, uh, this post from Tucker Carlson. I have no doubt that this is true. This, this absolutely uh, sounds like something the Biden White House or Lloyd Austin would, uh, would do or say to Congress because there is just a general freak out, a general panic that is gripping the Biden White House from Biden to Austin to Blinken to Kirby. So I have no doubt that Austin told Congress, if you don't give money to Project Ukraine, then our sons and daughters and cousins, they're going to have to fight the Russians because the narrative is that once Russia wins in Ukraine, then they're going to invade all of, all of Europe, all of NATO. That's, that's the narrative. And they've actually said this in the past. They've kind of circled back around to this, uh, to this narrative about Russia invading Europe and recreating the Tsar Empire or the Soviet Union, or even going beyond that, capturing France or something like that. So um, this is a narrative that they've recycled. I have no doubt that this is true, but I don't think it's a, it's a shocking revelation. It sounds like something Lloyd Austin would absolutely say to Congress in order to try and get them to, to pour money to Project Ukraine. Just, just one final note. Three, four days ago, Austin was saying that Congress should give money to Ukraine because it would be good for American jobs. So we've gone from good to American jobs to invading Europe. Anyway, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think most likely it was said. I mean, we've had some indirect confirmations about the kind of things that he was saying. I mean, there's uh, there's a, one of the people who was there, who was a, a, a for, House Foreign Affairs chairman, Michael McCall. <coughs> he said that... Um, Austin said to the Congress people that it was very likely if they didn't pass funding for you know, Ukraine, very likely that it would lead to US troops fighting a war in Europe. If, this is a direct quote now, if Vladimir Putin takes over Ukraine, he'll get Moldova, Georgia, then maybe the Baltics. And a couple of days ago, there was an article in the Financial Times, which Gideon Rackman, who's a very well-connected journalist, said that people in the US, uh, in the government, in the US government, in the offices in the US government are now worried that by the end of 2024, Putin might be threatening the Baltic states. And then we had John Kirby also talking about these flesh creeping things, you know, that Putin's appetite will grow with the eating if he takes Ukraine and uh, he'll be able to move on and advance into all kinds of other places. So, you know, I Rustin Shackelford has a good question in the chat. Wonder what the world would look like if neocons did not exist. So I think the United States would have a more distant more normal relationship with Israel. I don't think we would have invaded Iraq in 2003. We would not have occupied Afghanistan, possibly not even invaded Afghanistan in 2001. So I think the United States would have saved trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives and be in a much you know, safer and stronger position in the world if there was not this uh, formidable neoconservative lobby. I, I think that Austin did say it, and I think it's also very much of a piece. I mean, it's, it's it, if you watch that program with, um, that we did um, our, with Colonel, Wilkins, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was Colin Powell's um, chief, of, uh, chief of staff, and we did on the Duran, uh, Wilkerson said he gave, an, he gave a sense of what these people are like to deal with in interpersonal reactions. When they're thwarted, they become extremely angry. I mean, there is no, uh, uh, hell hath no fury than a neocon scorned, if I can say it like that. So, I mean, I, I think this is exactly what happened. What, what it tells me is that the administration's narrative is coming up against a lot of resistance. And that, as you might expect, you know, given that he is a neocon, he lost his temper. And I think other people in the administration are losing their temper. But it's clear now that this is becoming an issue in American domestic politics, that there's a strong group of people in the Republican Party who are outright opposed to further funding from Ukraine. There was a vote in the Senate where the Senate... Ref the Republicans may very well hold their ground and refuse further funding of Ukraine, which even a couple of weeks ago seemed unthinkable. All right, uh, the, the, two, the two sides were basically similarly supportive of funding Ukraine. But now, because of Biden's blunders, meaning because he's not willing to at least allocate some money to defending our own southern border, Republicans may well dig in their heels and not fund Ukraine, which will probably bring a very swift end to the conflict. And uh, I think Republicans are seeing how disastrously all this is playing out for Biden's domestic political fortunes. Refused to move forward with a procedural motion for funding for Ukraine. One uh, uh, senator who is generally aligned with the Democrats, he's an independent from Vermont, voted with the Republicans against further funding for Ukraine. I personally believe that eventually, because... To be straightforward about it, most people in Congress are either outright neocons or people who generally accept neocon narratives. They will authorize some funding for you.
And Rustin adds, although Wilsonian, referring to the president during World War One, the American president during World War One, Wilsonian wars for democracy has been a feeling in our at least for the last hundred years. Yeah, but a lot of that is rhetoric. All right, the United States was late entering both World War One and World War Two, and they had massive gains in in power with relatively little sacrifice compared to what the you know, starting nations in these conflicts had to pay. And so America has often conducted itself ruthlessly while using pro-democracy rhetoric. So rhetoric is one thing. Actions are another. What, what makes neoconservatives different from just Wilsonians is that they pro- propose you know, more wars, more use of American force overseas than even uh, Wilsonians wanting to promote democracy. A lot of Wilsonians wanting to promote democracy Woodrow Wilson was the president during World War One. A lot of Wilsonian talk about promoting democracy. It's not nearly as reckless as the neoconservative agenda to, you know, fight multiple wars at the same time. Ukraine. But what it shows is that there is a huge amount of resistance now within Congress to this issue. And of course, when we see this new version of the domino theory um, discredited, when um, you know the Russians win in Ukraine, and as everybody now expects that they will, when the, you know, the Russians finally defeat. Um, the Ukraine, and none of these terrifying things that we're hearing about actually happens. Well, then at that point, all of these people will try and forget the fact that they ever said these things. The other thing I would say about this particular episode is that, to my mind, the really big thing, the thing that's really worrying the administration, more even than the fall of Ukraine, is the uh, fear of what will happen in the election. And again, going back to that article by Gideon Rapp. Right. So the, <laughs> the Biden administration wants to be re-elected. And so a lot of our showy support for Ukraine and for Taiwan and for Israel is based on the Biden administration's theories on what Joe Biden needs to do to become more popular and get reelected, even though these interventions are not in America's best interests. There was apparently people telling him from within the Democratic Party, within the DNC, that they're worried that unless this funding gets through, then in January, people will be starting to talk about Joe Biden as the man who lost Ukraine. And that's what they really want to avoid. They- right. We, we didn't need a war in Ukraine to begin with if we hadn't been arming Ukraine the last few years, trying to bring it into NATO uh, de facto in addition to de jure. Right. We wouldn't be in this situation uh, Alexander Mercurius on his show last night had some additional thoughts. Be prepared to attack. It's clear that despite being asked by members of the House of Representatives from the Republican caucus, Lloyd Austin, however, was unable to come up with any strategy for a potential victory in Ukraine. And it seems that the meeting became increasingly acrimonious. And this comment that Lloyd Austin made, and it seems he did make it, appears to have been made in exhaustion. And the, the comment was that if we don't subsidize Ukraine, that American boys will have to go fight Russia in Europe. Inspiration and anger. And of course, its only effect was to make the Republican Congress people angry as well. And of course, when people start to become angry, they become more stubborn. And my sense is that the administration's attempts to try to persuade the Congress people to change their stance on aid for Ukraine, it might have misfired. It might have made that opposition stronger. And just an extraordinary comment here from Joe Biden. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to speak to you today about an urgent responsibility the Congress has to uphold the national security needs of the United States, and quite frankly, of our partners as well. This cannot wait. Congress needs to pass supplemental funding for Ukraine before they break for the holiday resources. It's as simple as that. Frankly, I think it's stunning that we've gotten to this point in the first place. While Congress, Republicans in Congress, are willing to give Putin the greatest gift he could hope for and abandon our global leadership, <clears throat> not just in Ukraine, but beyond that. If Putin takes Ukraine, he won't stop there. It's important to see the long run here. He's going to keep going. He's made that pretty clear. If Putin attacks a NATO ally, then we'll have something that we don't seek and that we don't have today. American troops fighting Russian troops. American troops fighting Russian troops if he moves into other parts of NATO. 
Extreme Republicans are playing chicken with our national security, holding Ukraine's funding hostage to their extreme partisan border policies. And now they're willing to literally kneecap Ukraine on the battlefield and damage our national security in the process. Look, I know we have our divisions at home. Let's get past them. This is critical. Petty, partisan, angry politics can't get in the way of our responsibility as a leading nation in the world. We can't let Putin win. Say it again, we can't let Putin win. It's in our overwhelming national interest and international interest of all our friends. Yeah, just uh, absurd comments. There's, there's no evidence that uh, Putin is planning to take all of Ukraine, let alone to go into uh, other nations, including NATO nations. It's the, the discredited domino theory. Rather than weaker, which, of course, calls into doubt the entire enterprise. We know that we can't. There's going to be five working days left before Congress rises on Friday. Of course, that's always assuming that Mike Johnson sticks to his position that Congress will indeed rise next Friday. The British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, once said that a week is a long time in politics. So, so when have we heard about the domino theory before? That was an argument used to support our intervention in Vietnam. Now, I think our intervention in South Korea may very well have been in America's best interests, right? America does have an interest in maintaining alliances. Probably the most vulnerable we ever got vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union was when we let our defense spending go after about 1946 until about uh, 1950. The invasion of South Korea all right, woke us up to a renewed defensive commitment. And so I think repelling that invasion, preserving South Korea, is probably in America's best interest. It was probably worth the 50 thousand plus American lives to preserve that that country, South Korea, that ally, all right, instead of allowing the Soviet communists through their proxies to keep pushing for, for more and more territory. Now, on the other hand, I think the Vietnam intervention was miscalculated and it was in part sold on domino theory that if we allow the communists to take Vietnam, that next they'll take Thailand and they'll just keep marching. In reality, as a regime overextends itself, all right, it gets into trouble and it malfunctions and it, it is not in their own best interest to infinitely extend itself because when you extend yourself too far, you become, by definition, overextended and you become more vulnerable. We see the Soviet Union falling into that trap when they invaded Afghanistan. That became a, an enormous debacle that, that played a large role in the destruction of both the Soviet Union and Russia as a great power. So it's possible that there might be a big turnaround in thinking on the part of Republican Congress people over the course of this week. But I have to say, at the moment, I don't see why that shift on the part of Congress Republicans should take place. From their perspective, which is ultimately, I would have assumed, an electoral one, things for the moment appear to be going their way. The president's uh, ratings are falling. The position the Republican Congress people are taking seems to be generally supported amongst uh, um, the American, with the American people. And the president has just suffered a major personal blow. And a sign of how serious for him it is, is provided by the fact that the media, I notice, is largely ignoring it. They're Except for Fox News, where it's the dominant story the past few days. Pretending that basically, or they're acting as if it didn't happen, or as if it isn't particularly important. And that blow is that the president's son has now been indicted. There's apparently four, nine different charges. They appear to be, so far as I can tell, essentially about tax evasion and fraud. I'm not going to analyse the charges in detail, certainly not in this programme. I'm not going to discuss the outcome of any possible legal proceedings I would simply say that the president's son, like everyone else who is the subject of an indictment, is, indi is entitled to the presumption of innocence as everyone else in that kind of situation. Yeah, of course. So why do we still have troops in South Korea to act as a tripwire to, determine, to deter China, China's aggression? Because as 
China, let's say China becomes a regional hegemon. The United States is a hegemon in the Americas, right? There is no other great power with a military base in the Americas. That allows America then to feel free to roam all over the globe. If China became a regional hegemon as the U.S. is a regional hegemon, then China would feel free to roam. And that's why the United States wants to contain the rise of China. Part of that strategy is maintaining an independent South Korea and enlisting South Korea and Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines, Australia in efforts to try to control the rise and expansion of China. Should be. But of course, we're not here talking about about a um, simple legal process because the person indicted is the president's son. There have been claims that the president himself is connected to his son's business activities. There have been reports in the media. You can find a lot of detail about all of this, by the way, on Jonathan Turley's blog, Res Ipsa Loquita. There's reports that some of the funds that um, the son was handling found their way to the president himself, which is indicative, even if it is not definitive of anything very much. But I can't imagine that this isn't going to play badly for the president in the forthcoming election. And beyond that, of course, there is the issue of what personal effect it will have on the president that his son is now being indicted in this particular way. It will be... Okay, Josh Randall raises a very strong challenge. He says, I disavow Luke's choice of stream time. Formal disavowal. He's raising his disavowal to the formal level. In fact, formidable, formidable challenge. Well, this is what happened. I, I woke up about midnight and I was thinking about historian Robert Kagan. And I'm sure we all here have had the experience of like waking up in the, the middle of the, the night concerned about historian Robert Kagan. So Robert Kagan has been publishing essays warning about Trump will become a dictator if he is reelected in, in 2024. And I, I woke up at midnight and I thought, wait, wasn't Victoria, isn't Victoria Newland his wife? And then I, I got up and, and I, I wrote down, you know, investigate, isn't Victoria Newland his wife? Victoria Newland was the American diplomat who was largely overseeing the 2013-2014 Ukraine rebellion against its democratically elected pro-Russian president. And she was taped on a phone call making all sorts of remarks about how Ukraine should operate. And she said, uh, you know, F the EU. And, and I thought, isn't Robert, isn't, uh, isn't Robert Kagan, isn't he some major neocon? Yeah. And uh, let's official see talking this. about diplomatic efforts in Ukraine. The last thing you want to do is drop your guard. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And you know, f the EU. But that is exactly what reportedly happened between U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland and U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Pyatt. The exchange has since surfaced online, including the crude swipe at the European Union. The audio clip of a woman and man, said to be Newland and Pyatt, hears them discussing strategies to work with the three main opposition figures. I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. In terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. There is a suggestion for Newland to contact Klitschko directly to play to his top dog sensibilities. OK, so just a disastrous audio leak probably orchestrated by the Russians from this phone call. This is Victoria Newland, husband's Robert Kagan. And about 3.15 this morning, I said, I I'm getting up. I've got to go investigate this. And I, I looked it up and Robert Kagan is indeed this, this major neocon agitator. And his wife is now... Uh, Under Secretary to Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, 
And so she's just been all over this Ukraine mess for, for approximately 10 years now. So she resigned during the Trump administration. And so I thought, I got I to gotta get up. I got to stream about this. And I, I just couldn't, couldn't wait for, for a more polite hour. Let's have a look at the chat. Uh, there's a comment. It wasn't a good idea to ban Japan from having a navy. Japan has a formidable navy, right? Japan's deep water navy is far more formidable and efficient and effective th than China's. So I'm not sure where I got the idea that we, we ban Japan from having a navy. Japan has an incredible navy. And Josh says, did Lee Harvey Oswald act alone has woken me up at midnight many times. I assure you, Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Uh, the many bases I have for that is that no group would ever hire someone as mentally unstable as uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to act for them, right? That would just be, that would be just a level of recklessness that I don't think the CIA or the mafia would, or, or any, any group would ever engage in. Okay, a little bit more here from Alexander McCurris. A major distraction for him, at the very least, and to my way of thinking, by the way, it further calls into question whether he should be standing for the presidency in this in these sort of circumstances at all. But anyway, that's another topic for another day. So, given the, given given that this is so, given that the military situation in Ukraine is becoming increasingly bad, given that politically speaking, so I just discovered the Duran and Alexander Makuris about a month ago because I heard uh, John J. Mearsheimer say that he listens to this guy. Alexander Makuris every every day. Now I, I notice on archives of their their podcast that they have some you know quite nutty figures on. So there there could be some absolutely devastating critiques of this man in particular, Alexander Makuris, or of the Duran podcast in general that I'm simply unaware of at this point. But right now I just find him a refreshing voice, articulating points of view that I don't hear much in the the mainstream media and that I think deserve an airing. Uh, later today, I might find, you know, devastating decoding information about these guys. But for now, I, I appreciate their perspective. The administration seems to be in deep difficulties and worsening difficulties, given that Speaker Johnson has again been talking about possible impeachment proceedings against the president himself, given that um, the stance the Republicans in Congress are taking seem to be generally supported by the American people. Why would the Republicans over the next five days want to change their stance? Now, I'm not saying that they won't. In politics, as I said, many things happen. But I would, I'm starting to think, especially after the reports that I've seen of what actually happened in Congress last week, the Lloyd Austin exchange in particular, I'm starting to think that Republican hostility to the further funding of this war has now hardened and that it is becoming... Um, is becoming so chat says if uh, japan has a formidable navy then let japan use it to contain china's projection eastward well we are japan's the most important american ally so australia is america's closest ally but japan is america's most important ally particularly with regard to defending taiwan so there is a window of american weakness and chinese strength to attack and take over taiwan and extend itself past the first island chain, it keep extending itself into the Pacific Ocean, all right, and keep dominating its area. So right now, China's kind of bottled up by Taiwan and American alliances. If China takes Taiwan, it will show many American allies that America's a paper tiger, and they won't be nearly as likely to form alliances and sacrifice for an alliance with the United States if the U.S. allows Taiwan to be taken down. So there's a, a window of vulnerability right now, and we, we badly need Japan in the fight to try to protect Taiwan for the next 10 years. Irresistible. That, in turn, ought to ring alarm bells in Kiev, and the political leadership there needs to start thinking very carefully, something which I admit they've shown little sign of being able to do, about their own prospects. If US aid is indeed cut off, if Ukraine ceases to receive the weapons and equipment that they have been receiving from the United States, and already that has been, the amount of that has been declining, it's apparently now reduced to a trickle, and the same is the case from Europe. 
if the so I'm basing that analysis on this book, which I just finished reading, came out last year, Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China by Hal Brands and Michael Beckley. Aid from the United States, the military aid is cut off. If the economic aid is cut off also, and that is also starting to look like a real possibility, the United States seems most unlikely to continue to fund Ukraine in any form if military aid is cut off. And as for the European Union, they're having real difficulties at the moment, agreeing on their 50 billion euro uh, package for Ukraine for next year. The Hungarians and the Slovaks having made clear their own um, essential opposition to this. Well, if that is indeed so, then it becomes increasingly clear that their prospects, already bleak, are going to become more bleak still. They, without financial support from the West, how do they keep their army, their police force, their civil service, the pensioners, the people on welfare systems, the university professors, the teachers? Or- yes, very tough times coming up for Ukraine, but probably best for the United States to get out of this conflict if that is at all possible. Here's a little bit more on Gaza. Predicting for months, we have seen another battle at the UN Security Council over the Gaza situation. And importantly, on this occasion, this demand that the Security Council heard yesterday, last night, came not from a member state, but from the UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres. He made a request that the Security Council meet under Chapter 99 of the UN Charter on the basis that he, as UN Secretary General, now perceives a threat to peace from the situation in Gaza and the Middle East. That opened the way for the United Arab Emirates to make, to propose a draft resolution calling for an immediate humanitarian and extended humanitarian pause, in other words, a ceasefire. The draft resolution also demanded immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, as well as humanitarian access to, to Gaza. The Security Council meeting was dominated by a passionate submission by UN Secretary General Guterres, who spoke about a catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. And however, perhaps the most important comments of all were made by the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed Issa Abu Shahab, who noted that the resolution that his country had be, had proposed, the one that sought a ceasefire, received co-sponsorship from at least 97 member states, UN member states, within 24 hours gives us a sense of the extent to which international opinion is now building. And the United States vetoed the resolution. And in doing so, it was abandoned by all its allies. Britain abstained, citing the fact that the resolution didn't criticize Hamas, an extremely weak speech, by the way, by the British representative. All of the other countries who are allies of the United States, Japan, Albania, France, um, Ecuador, <laughs> they all voted, Switzerland, they all voted to support this resolution. And the United States was left alone vetoing it. Now, that of course has happened many times before in the past, but already there are criticisms that by vetoing resolutions of this nature, the United States is becoming an accessory to the war crimes that many states are now saying are taking place. So right now, it looks to the world, whatever Israel does in Gaza, all right, the, the United States is held accountable that U.S. and Israel are essentially regarded by much of the world as co-belligerents in Gaza. And so if uh, Israel kills too many civilians, right, if Israel gets stuck down into some kind of quagmire, right, if there's just a bloody mess in Gaza, right, the United States is held equally responsible in the eyes of much of the world as Israel, the actual, you know, active party, because the United States is providing, you know, moral support, financial support, uh, arms support to Israel. And Joe Biden went over there, hugged Bibi Netanyahu. So unnecessary U.S. involvement, just a disastrous trip by Biden to Israel. The more support that uh, America gives Israel, then the more Israel's actions will reflect on America. And different countries have different interests, right? The interests of Israel are not identical to the interests of the United States. And I have some sympathy for the argument, hey, Israel's the one democracy in the, the Middle East. We, we should uh, support it against the 
you know, sea of dictatorships that surround it. And I think there's, there's something to that, but there are varying levels of support. And the ham-fisted, blatant, you know, unnecessarily provocative way that the United States has stood with Israel in this conflict is not serving the U.S. well in the eyes of much of the world, precipitating who knows how many more 9-11-style attacks on the, on the United States of America. And why have we so far abstained from bombing Iran? Because the U.S. has shifted such significant military assets to the Middle East. I think in part, we have those assets there. If Hezbollah goes into an all-out attack on Israel, right, and Israel is forced to fight a two-front war, the Biden administration wants to have American military assets and aircraft carriers there to, to protect Israel and to fight against Hezbollah. So that's one way the United States could get directly mil- militarily involved in this conflict. The other way, and I think much of the Biden administration is leaning in this direction, as much of the neoconservative movements have wandered for decades, there is considerable support within the Biden administration for an all-out direct attack on Iran. Why has it not happened yet? This is the best explanation I've heard yet. This is from the Duran podcast once again three days ago. They found that the Saudis and uh, uh, we're not going to shift their policies. Uh, They were not going to support this strike. Right. So I think the Biden administration was eager for a direct attack on Iran. But then Iran is Shia. All right. Saudi Arabia has been a longtime enemy of Iran. It is Sunni. And so the Biden administration thought that they could gather considerable Sunni support for a direct attack on Iran's Shia regime. And they've been disappointed. Wars. He says about how they were planning seven wars at the time when he was serving in the government and how rude and impossible they are to deal with on a personal basis. So these are the people who are still there in the administration. They completely misjudged the international reaction. They found that the Saudis and, uh, uh, were not going to shift their policies. Uh, they were not going to support this strike on Iran, that they're uh, committed to the rapprochement with Iran. They found that the Egyptians were not prepared to play along, nor was the King of Jordan. They found the Arab world uniting um, against these disastrous plans. And they also found that the international community was, you know, the, the global, you know, the global south, everyone else was uniting against these plans also. And last but not least, they found that the Democratic Party's coalition within the United States was fracturing. So they have, they had to stop, they had to stop their planning even as all the pieces that they sort of deployed on the chessboard were still in motion. So we still get all of these massive military deployments taking place, but increasingly looking as if they are really serving no actual purpose anymore. And of course, we also see the Israelis pressing on with their campaign in Gaza, which to get reiterated again, they were given the green light to do. And the US government, the administration, is now having switched this on, is fighting it all but impossible without experiencing significant political damage in the US to simply switch it off again. So this is this is this is why they're caught in the way that exactly the way that you describe. Yeah. And uh, we're already getting reports of, of the damage on. Uh... OK, that that strikes me as a good explanation as any for why the United States hasn't already directly started uh, bombing Iran. All right. Interesting article in The New York Times yesterday. Talk of a Trump dictatorship charges the American political debate. Former President Donald J. Trump and his allies are not doing much to reassure those worried about his autocratic instincts. If anything, they seem to be leaning into the predictions. Peter Baker writes, when a historian wrote an essay the other day warning that the election of former President Donald J. Trump next year could lead to a dictatorship, one of Mr. Trump's allies quickly responded by calling for the historian to be sent to prison. Almost sounds like a parody. The response to concerns about dictatorship is to prosecute the author. But Mr. Trump and his allies are not going out of their way to reassure those worried about what a new term would bring by firmly rejecting the dictatorship charge. If anything, they seem to be leaning into it. And I I just have a hard time taking these dictatorship charges seriously, just like my mind would, would be unable to pay attention for long to the Russiagate charges that dominated American news media between January 2017 and uh, midway point of, of 2019. I could, whenever I, I would read about Russiagate, I'd, I'd start to get a headache. It just didn't make much sense. And we, we finally realized that there was never, 
substance to these accusations that many of the details were correct, but the overall idea that millions of Americans believe that uh, Russia hacked our election in 2016 is absurd. The idea that Donald J. Trump is a Russian asset is absurd. So the the media was usually careful in its reporting of details, but the inference that it would promote for two and a half years, essentially, that Trump was a Russian asset uh, or that uh, Putin hacked our 2016 election were absolutely absurd. And so who's this historian who wrote an essay warning that the election of Trump could lead to dictatorship? Well, it's Robert Kagan, right, who I would described more as a neocon propagandist. So in 1997, he co-founded the now defunct neoconservative think tank project for the new American century with William Crystal, which envis- envisaged you know, about seven different American wars. Uh, Kagan was an early strong advocate of American military action in Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, and Iraq, right, from 1998 onward. After the 1998 bombing of Iraq was announced, Kagan said, bombing Iraq isn't enough. Remember, sanctions against Iraq may, may well have cost the lives of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children. Right, uh, Robert Kagan in 1998 was calling on President Clinton to send ground troops to Iraq. January 2002, Robert Kagan and Irving Kristol falsely claimed in a weekly Standard article that Saddam Hussein was supporting the existence of a terrorist training camp in Iraq complete with a Boeing 707 for practicing hijackings and filled with non-Iraqi radical Muslims. Then they further alleged that September 11 hijacker Mohammed Atta met with an Iraqi intelligence official several months before the attack. These allegations were shown to be false. I remember Dennis Prager on his radio show talking to an editor at the Weekly Standard about these charges and Prager kept saying, why aren't these charges being reported in the rest of the news media? Well, because these, these charges were false. 2008, Robert Kagan wrote an article called Neocon Nation, Neoconservatism for World Affairs, describing the main components of American neoconservatism as a belief in the rectitude, meaning the rightness, the morality of applying U.S. moralism to the world stage, support for the U.S. to act alone, the promotion of American-style liberty and democracy in other countries, the belief in American hegemony and the confidence in U.S. military power and a distrust of international institutions. And uh, Kagan has often been referred to as the chief neoconservative foreign policy theorist. In uh, July 2000, Robert Kagan wrote that the problem with Colin Powell is his political and strategic judgment is not aggressive enough. That's my interpretation. Colin Powell doesn't believe the United States should enter into conflicts without strong public support, but he also doesn't believe that the public will support anything. That kind of iron logic rules out almost every conceivable post-Cold War intervention. When he talks intervention here, he means U.S. military intervention. In 2003, Robert Kagan's book, Paradise and Power, American Europe in the New World Order, published on the eve of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, created a sensation through its assertion that Europeans tended to favor peaceful resolutions of international disputes while the Americans take a more Hobbesian view in which many kinds of disagreements can only be settled by force, or as Kagan puts it, Americans are from Mars, Europeans are from Venus. In 2016, February, Robert Kagan publicly left the Republican Party, that's referring to himself as a former Republican, he endorsed Democrat Hillary Clinton for president because he was so afraid of uh, what he saw as an isolationist turn. Now, there is one area where I support Joe Biden's foreign policy over Donald Trump's foreign policy in that I believe that Donald Trump was consistently careless, reckless, and destructive of our relationships with our allies. And so I think Joe Biden has done a better job building our alliances, all right? We are more powerful through alliances. It's like getting matching donations. I don't know how you raise money in your church or synagogue, but often in in synagogues that I attend, someone will put up an offer to match any donations over the, the next two weeks or a month, all right? And that's a way to, you know, multiply donations and you can multiply power by forming alliances. And I think the Biden administration has done a better job than the Trump administration in working with our allies. But I think the way that Biden has worked with our allies to subsidize and instigate the war in Ukraine has been an absolute uh, disaster. And September 2021, Robert Kagan wrote an opinion essay published in the Washington Post, our constitutional crisis is already here because of Donald Trump. And then last week he published another essay 
Trump dictatorship is increasingly inevitable. We should stop pretending. And so this guy is married to Victoria Newland, who is the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs under Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. So she made appearances supporting protesters in Ukraine back in 2013, 2014, during the Maidan uprising against a democratically elected pro-Russian president of Ukraine. She said that the U.S. has spent $5 billion building democracy in Ukraine since 1991. Russia did not you know, take well to this statement. They claimed it was evidence that the U.S. was orchestrating a revolution against Russia's interests, which is probably true. Then I played earlier that, that phone call where she talked about who would be the best uh, prime minister of Ukraine and that we should F the EU. So to me, people like Robert Kagan and Victoria Nuland, they embodied the worst of the U.S. foreign policy establishment because they consistently push for unnecessary American military intervention overseas. Now, my primary response to the charge that Donald Trump wants to become a dictator is that he has never shown much ability nor interest at running things. Right? He wants attention, and the more conflict he engenders, the more attention he gets. Paul Gottfried, back in 2012, had a pretty short, sweet analysis of Robert Kagan. It says, Robert Kagan, who seems to relish every war the U.S. has been in, regrets we haven't fought more of them even longer. So now he's selling himself as some kind of foreign policy realist, or the realists he admires are people like himself who support all of America's past military adventures, presumably would favor lots more military intervention in the future. And I like Steve Saylor's analysis about these wild charges regarding Donald Trump wanting to be a dictator. So November 6, 2020, Steve Saylor tweeted, Donald Trump is just about the least authoritarian president since, say, Calvin Coolidge. Those who obsess about Trump's authoritarianism are projecting their own dark anti-democracy urges on Trump. So both right and left at times are anti-democratic. So the left wants to overturn populist measures, such as the Prop 187 passed in California to restrict uh, government welfare to illegal immigrants that was overturned by judges. So the left, generally speaking, likes judicial intervention that nullifies Republican legislation or Republican populist referendums. And then the right, in, in its own various ways, is quite willing to go against uh, popular opinion. So both sides don't tend to see democracy as an unalloyed good. And we don't live just simply in a democracy, right? The system we have contains elements of democracy, elements of dictatorship, in that the U.S. president has all the foreign policy powers of you know, King George III at the time of the American Revolution, right? The American president can essentially send us to war without the approval of, of Congress. And then we have, you know, ways that we're an oligopoly where just, you know, a few people have a, an outsized amount of power, though it's not as severe as it was in the past. So Jeff Bezos has something like 0.06% of the total American GNP, while uh, Rocke was it Rockefeller? No, who was the, the great oil baron from the late 19th century? But anyway, at his height, he alone controlled 2% of America's GNP. So America was probably much more of an oligopoly back in the late uh, 19th century. Steve Saylor wrote October 9, 2018, yeah, Republicans just on the verge of rounding up dissidents into soccer stadiums. That's why the stock market has hammered down Jeff Bezos' net worth down. Well, that's not the point. <laughs> All right. So if, if we're on the verge of the stock of a Trump dictatorship, the stock market would be plunging. Right, because in a dictatorship, right, wealth can just be arbitrarily confiscated. The reason so much of the world's wealth pours into the United States is faith in American institutions of the rule of law and democratic procedures and um, American enforcement of laws, and that uh, America is comparatively low in corruption compared to other countries. So, if we really were staring down the face of a Trump dictatorship, the stock market would be absolutely crashing and foreigners would be withdrawing hundreds of billions of dollars from America. That's not happening. So words are easy, right? Saying that Trump could be a dictator, effortless to say that. But if there was any reality to these charges, you'd see hundreds of billions, trillions eventually uh, dollars fleeing out of the United States, the American stock market crashing, the American dollar crashing. None of that's happening because the people with real skin in the game, the people with billions and trillions of dollars in the game,
do not take seriously these accusations that uh, Donald Trump is going to be some kind of you know, nasty dictator. And I, I agree with Saylor here. He says Trump would be bored about the second hour of a full authoritarian regime. He'd let his cricket critics out of the soccer stadiums to give him somebody to fight with. I don't think there's anybody in American public life who loves the conflict of democratic politics more than Trump. Authoritarianism in the European sense that brought to power both Hitler and Charles de Gaulle was connected to the feeling that partisan debate was unseemly. Donald Trump does not regard debate as unseemly. Donald Trump loves conflict. His enemies typically hate Trump because they find his love of conflict unseemly. They long for a philosopher king like Obama, under whom they could serve as PR flax, crafting conversations in which the citizenry's job is to shut up and to listen to their betters' talking points. So Trump is kind of the second coming of his role model, George Steinbrenner. So Staler, I think, quite accurately views Donald Trump through the lens of the 1977-81 World Series rivalry of George Steinbrenner's New York Yankees and the O'Malley family's Los Angeles Dodgers. So the O'Malley's ran a superb authoritarian corporation in the Dodgers where everybody had to follow the corporate PR line that everything was copacetic and the Dodgers were extremely opaque and largely co-opted the media into going along with their strategy. By contrast, the early Steinbrenner Yankees were the most public controversy-friendly baseball team of all time with George Steinbrenner, Billy Martin, Reggie Jackson, Thurman Munson engaged in a war of all against all carried out on the back cover of the tabloids. And that's kind of Donald Trump's way. So the Joe Biden regime seems so much more cohesive, just like the O'Malley regime seems so much more cohesive than the New York Yankee regime. But even though the Biden administration, generally speaking, does not leak against itself, it does not carry out its fights in public, all right, there's not all these unseemly conflicts between various members of the Biden administration as there was during the Trump administration. On the other hand, the Joe Biden administration is the most reckless, dangerous, incompetent foreign policy administration we've had in 80 plus years. January 2018, Steve Saylor wrote, it's comical that so many have denounced Donald Trump as an authoritarian whose election threatens that democracy dies in the dark, as Jeff Bezos' Washington Post claims. In reality, Trump's administration is the most public in memory, right? The Biden administration doesn't leak, right? The Trump administration constantly leaked. Comics are making jokes about the president for the first time since 2008. Americans are enthusiastically arguing over politics. Trump, love him or hate him, has revitalized our democracy. The authoritarian Bezos runs his Amazon company very much along the closed, manipulative O'Malleyite lines rather than the Trump wide open, brawling Steinbrennist principles. Right. And uh, Jeff Bezos, under the supposedly authoritarian dictatorial Donald Trump, became the richest man in the history of the world while fighting with Donald Trump. October 8, 2021, Steve Saylor noted, Donald Trump's extraordinary effort to overturn the 2020 election result didn't take much thwarting. Trump told various officials to do something. They said, we'll resign. Trump responded, OK, you win. All right. So I think it was a disaster, a terrible thing that uh, Donald Trump tried to fight the overwhelming election results against him in 2020. I think that Donald Trump bears some moral responsibility for the ugly January 6th riots. I wish that Trump had followed protocol and shown up for the inauguration of Joe Biden. But I don't think 